Hello, everybody. This is Noah and John, and we are from Urban Digs. And today we're talking Manhattan, Johnny. And we got the man, we got Brian Lewis from Compass, the myth, the legend, the incredible. Yeah, the Can't legend. think of anything else. Yeah, Jonathan yeah, well, Mel is going to be a little upset. Right? <laughs> yeah, we, we <laughs> last spoke to Brian back in 2019, so pre-pandemic, and it was a completely different market. Then. It was a buyer's market. We had just come off, you know, all the uh, the mansion tax had changed that the, that summer. So now here we are. It's The market has flipped 180 degrees, so I, I'm sure Brian, again, will be the candle in the darkness, as we referred to last yeah. time, the canary in the coal mine. So, you, well, hopefully not. Words. I don't want the you carry. Are, that's a recall, man. That's pre-pandemic <laughs> right. recall. You're All good. right. Well, let's let, let's go right into it, Brian. Uh, the last time we spoke to you was before the pandemic, and here we are after the pandemic. And let's what, just go high level. What is pandemic? happening? Can you? I don't even. I don't even want to hear that I word don't anymore. Even know what that is, guys. First of all, does that seem like an eternity ago? Like yes, seriously. Yeah. And uh, we 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 rode that. We wrote it. We did it. We all hunkered down. And, and I think we agents deserve a lot of credit through that, you know, because we went through something that maybe they haven't gone through in a hundred years, but life was different. And I got to tell you, there's, there's some pats on the back deserved. And I mean that for everybody in our industry, I think for the most part, the behavior was really good. We were on it. We were entrepreneurial. I, I feel like we did something. And I think future generations are going to see that because you know what? it's hard enough to be a broker you know in, in general and in to think about all the times. ways in the in all the ways you had to adapt and 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 be creative to to handle oh, the unique man. situations i can imagine thinking I back feel on like that. we were all a little bit macgyver like here we are working from our homes for while the governor said we cannot leave our house in service of our license <laughs> but we yeah. still have to feed our families yeah we were macgyvering stuff i mean you've heard stories about deals done that were the sight unseen and the, you know, the zoom showing we did it all but yeah what, what i feel is happening now guys is i feel like that slingshot market you know that that catapulted us mm -hmm. back i feel like and i'm speaking anecdotally here i feel like it's it's not is it done i think it's done and i feel like we're now into the normal supply demand situation where we have, you know, the normal, the rates are this, the supply is up. Is it getting absorbed? This guy gets cocky because his neighbor just had an eight-way bidding war. He overprices. We have to pull him down a little bit. These are like my normal daily sparring challenges. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, and I will say that January, February, I was listening and leaning into you guys because you were saying there's no inventory. There's no inventory. There's no inventory. You're beating that drum. And I would literally send Urban Digs on Fridays to all the sellers that I had told should list, you know, in the normal spring market. And I said, no, height of Omicron. We're going to do this. We're listening. Yeah. We don't care if there's no leaves on the trees. Put on the mask. Let's control right. this. We got like, I've got like four good bidding war stories from that advice. Thank you guys. Wow. No, right. And going from like $2 million to $5 million. And then there were people that waited it out and we're still doing okay, to be clear. But right now, I got to tell you, I kind of wish it was January again. I, I, hmm. I really, that there's a more inventory build. And I find that human nature, a seller looks at what happened last and they want to have a little bit of whipped cream and a cherry to that price. And right. then they said, so we have some things that are just rocking and a rolling from like that one to three million range. And then have some things in that three to five sweet spot where maybe they're a little cocky and maybe the audience has gone down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing a lot these days is preparing for some sales that we have. We have something coming on for 10 million. We have some things at three, but I'm really having another talk with them. As a matter of fact, today, right after this podcast, I'm going over to a seller who frankly did not get what she wanted with another broker. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go in and we're going to talk truth about price. So it's like the, it's Holy Week. So it's the come to yeah. Jesus talk. <laughs> because yeah, I see the light. To, I want her to start on the right foot. You get one shot at being new. Yeah, I come armed with data, anecdotal and high level, like Urban Digs data and, you know, my colleagues. So we, I, we, I try to boil it down. I try to be real. Uh, make the marketing fun, but really that pricing on point has never been more important. I find it so efficient, the market. Yeah. 
That's great. I like the uh, I like the data shock and awe approach. Just just come with overwhelming data superiority. I mean, just there, there's no there's no question about it. But I mean, Brian, that was just really this is like a present for a podcast host who's talking about market data because you just brought up so many topics that I would like to dig into every single one. But I won't. I'll dig in just to, to talk about buyer and seller sentiment because you know last time you were on, I think you said some really relevant things, which is and you just repeated it again, which is like sellers like to see what happened just a second ago, like last month, maybe a little bit more than that. Why not? Whereas buyers are a little bit more forward looking and they kind of see like they can sense the inventory that's coming on. They sense that competition. And I'm curious right now, what are you seeing in terms of buyer and seller sentiment? Well, buyers are, they're riddled by these interest rate increases, right? I mean, these interest rates are way better than they were when my parents were dealing with them in the eighties, 12% or something right. like that. But still like, I mean, I myself did a, a refi at uh, 1.85 for 15 year fixed last fall. Like that, that's, I don't think you could touch that. Yeah. Now it's way more than double. So yeah. you just, that, that's an impactful thing with buyers. Here's the thing. First time buyers who might be renting right now, inflation is taking those rents right up. We're doing some rentals too. And I mean, I'm just seeing that climb and climb and climb. So what are they going to do? They're going to sit tight and watch rents rise, they're gonna jump in the game, but with the interest rates rising, I do feel that some buyers who are sensitive to that are, are pulling back. They're pulling back and they're really, really watching the nickels and the dimes. And if it has an assessment on it, we have a lot of conversations happening where we're trying to be creative, getting our sellers to prepay assessments to keep that monthly nut a little bit lower. We weren't necessarily having those conversations in the fall mm -hmm. and, and, and this winter, but now we are. We surely are. Um, I'm still getting a lot of buyers who feel like they are going to wait it out, that this is all going to stop when the recession hits that they know is coming. They feel that this is, you know, I'm not an economist, but uh, smart minds say that we might have, what is it, two quarters of, of negative growth or lower growth. Mm -hmm. So that they're, therein lies a recession. And feel, they feel like they're going to have something to get. And I feel like, you know, if you wait it out long enough, you're going to be right. You're gonna, if you wait it out, but if you got to deal with your family and your family's needs, you're going to get in. And we're making, yeah. we're making some good strides with buyers at every level, but I do sense a little reticence. And I, I get a lot of calls where brokers say, Brian, tell us if there's a bidding war. Is something going on? Because we're not even coming. We're not getting <laughs> in the buying panel with you. So um, I think also there's some buyer fatigue with that. But I think buyers are, are in a better position today than they were in January, at least anecdotally in my world. Right. Hey, Brian, and you know, I, I, I keep looking at the Urban Digs um, contract signed. Um, it's at such a high number. It's at 1,443 on a monthly basis, which is strong. I mean, very strong. And I'm wondering, um, maybe there was a little um, fear of missing out that kind of powered that number uh, a little bit because of this interest rate thing. I know a lot of buyers rushed to get a deal done, to sign, to lock in mm -hmm. before this whole thing happened. Um, this buyer fatigue, I'm starting to hear that a little bit, but I'm not seeing it in the overall data, but I'm starting to hear it anecdotally. So it's like, it, 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 and I can't, here's the biggest thing, April, like this is one of our busiest months, right? This is also one of our busiest months for new listing activity. So we have a ton of new listings coming on. We got a ton of contracts going signed. We have prices and here's the thing, prices that are up, but we in no way did what some of these other markets did, right? Wow. We are not, and that's, and that's I think, to, we are in such a, 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 our own unique little world ecosystem that we're operating in. We are not up 30, 40% in the last three years. No, like no some and I gotta tell you, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I see it every day. A lot of people think we're back in 2016. I think our volume of sales is really impressive, right? The volume of sales is there, but I feel like we're still in that 2019 vibe. If you had yeah. to put a number on mm -hmm. it, I see that every day. So I'm looking back and saying, well, your home was worth more in 2016 than it probably ever, ever was in recent memory. And we're not there yet, but we're yeah. moving in the right direction. We're, right. We're moving. We're yeah. moving that direction. And, and, That's and, right. and John, just one second. Um, do you have any sellers that bought in 2016 or 17 Tunnel. or even 18 no. that, that yeah. are, all right. Do you have any 2018 that are selling in their 
not getting their price? Like, well, that's do you have, it. Do you have if you bought, if evidence you bought like it that. 2016 and then you renovate, <laughs> like it's like, right. oh man, yeah, right. you created a better asset, but you just, you're likely not going to get it. But right. I, for example, I had something on 84th Street on the east side. We were trying, they did that. They bought at a, we, we took the price from what they paid. We, they did a bit of a renovation. We added some gravy to it. We got an eight-way bidding war because I put them on in January and they yeah. set a new price precedent. But I got to tell you, we would have done better in 2016 with that. That would have outperformed today. But because we have this thirst and hunger need to get in while the interest rates are better, but increasing if you just put it right on point, you put it out there right, you market it, you do a video. I like that. <laughs> um, you know, just another tool. And I just feel like that's the secret sauce. Just and it, it's in every price point. I don't think there's one price point that that's in, that's that that does not that that cannot benefit from. Right. I really do. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You know, one of the things you talked about last time too, I thought was really interesting, is you talked about the idea of building an urgency so if you if you've got a seller you got to try to you know build that urgency for buyers through you know clever marketing um and proper pricing and things like that and i'm wondering now you know as noah said and you you, you mentioned too look supply and demand are both at, at high levels and we don't necessarily know which one's going to win this battle because this is the time we're normally supposed to be high and if supply That's just right. keeps on going through the summer it's going to be a different story but if demand keeps pace with it like it has been for the last you know, year or so, you know, we could remain at a higher level. And I'm just curious, right now, with this buyer activity that's that's maybe not at white hot levels as it was, but it's still pretty, pretty solid. Do you still need to manufacture urgency for your sellers? Or can the buyer sort of sense that on their own? I think you have to always demonstrate scarcity, rarity, and uniqueness. And I think that's why my video narratives, at least the way I like to market, you really promotes that that's always my goal is to find what is special unique rare and interesting and sometimes guys the interest the interesting quality and the urgency really is the price because sometimes it's not that unique it's another yeah. apartment in that line in that building which there might be three on so the urgency has to be the uniqueness of marketing the story being told but also never forget the price it's that trifecta. You have to have it. You have to have it in every market. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, hey, Brian, uh, when are you considering the price reduction conversation these days? Oh, I got to tell you very quickly, uh, because I think you get one shot at being new, only mm -hmm. one. And as we learned in Hamilton, you're not going to waste your shot. And I feel like you can you can age out very quickly in this market. Um, present company, yes, I. Uh, but uh, seriously, when you when you put something on the market, you get one quick shot. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of demand. So you can learn very quickly if you're priced right. And right. I feel like you sometimes it can be as quickly as two weeks. Are you, you going to get it? like, yeah, but if you cut in two weeks, you're going to, uh, I guess the, the concern is going to be is that I look desperate, you know. Every home is different. Every mm -hmm. home is different. And right. every seller is different. But if I've had 20 people through a home in two weeks and no bids, that's a market in two weeks. If I have a market, if I have a home that's on for two weeks and it's getting no traction in a market where traction is happening, then that's also a market speaking. Right. If the home, everybody thinks their home is super unique and sometimes they are. But you must listen to that first two weeks. It is it is really, really important. It doesn't mean you move. Yeah. But you have to be having conversations. There has to be a lot of communication. Yeah. If you think uh, about the buyers, I mean, buyers are only care about all that new stuff, Brian. You know what I'm saying? They don't care about like once it's on the market for two weeks, it's it's they most of the buyer pools seen that online or at least already and then put it in the category of maybe a, or no, you know. Maybe no, watch it possibly. Maybe, yeah. you know, telling a new story with it, adjusting. And my, one of my favorite things to say is when people walk in the room and go, wow, I see that you moved that price in three weeks. What happened? Why did they do that? Yeah. I just say overpriced because right. you didn't come then. You didn't watch then. And I'm also really cognizant of pricing hurdles, mansion tax hurdles. Where are you positioned? If you're right under a certain number, that can bring you an entire different pool. 
sometimes it's better to be, you know, the, you, you want to be the, the sexiest in the group, right? It's, it's just, it's all, it's all about positioning and timing and finding that happy spot for it. And every home can have that. Every right. home can have that. And I, I and love discovering that path. It's, it's literally what I love the most. Finding a place, finding its voice, advocating for that, and getting the people to be excited about it. And so literally, I, I sold a place with multiple bids that had plywood floors recently. It was a full wreck. But finding the dignity in that home and the dignity yeah. in that opportunity was my great pleasure. I that's, love being that I, I have to interrupt you, Brian, because that's a fantastic jumping off point to talk about renovations. And you know, one of the things that we saw 2019, and I think you even talked about it then, it was like, it's difficult to sell a renovated apartment because there's, at that time, the supply of, of just apartments in general was such that why bother with a renovated one? I can pick one that's renovated. That's now, the problem is not only is there less supply of apartments in general, but the, the renovation timeline is screwed. The, the, the cost long, the cost curve is, is out of whack. I mean, everything is up for, up for air. I mean, all the timelines are shot. Renovations, what, renovations. what are you thinking on them? How are you advising sellers on those? I think the most important thing to do with renovations is get to a place that's palatable for the buyer. I've got a place right now where the outdoor space, we're about to put it on, is not connected to the apartment. They have plans for the stairs. They have city approvals. I'm like, let's promote that. As long as you can show the success path, as long as it's manageable and you have contractors with real bids saying, I can do that stairwell. I've got this expediter. Here's the cost. Here's the plan. The board has pre pre-approved this. If you can show a successful path that looks a little bit less daunting, being that Sherpa that can get through and slog through the jungle and make a path, you're going to build audience. When you build audience, you build value. If it's mysterious and there's a lot of like vagueness around something, there's no certainty, the money goes down and the audience diminishes. And that's what we do. I'm selling sponsor units now sometimes. And those are often things that need renovation. I often get people to give me bids. I, let, I get the sponsor to go right to the board to find out if they'll allow certain things. I like to create the path to the success yeah. so that more people can see it easily and spend more money on it. That's yeah, really yeah, what yeah. it comes down to. It's a great way of looking at it. Like you, you need to see the, the, the path, the, the journey right. that leads to where, where because you're I don't buy I don't buy into, and I've sold many things this fall, winter, spring, that need full guts and brokers go, no one's buying that. You have to renovate it. You have to stage it to make it look like it's not. I don't think you always do. You can sell the sizzle as long as the sizzle is achievable and looks certain. And yeah. when you have the certainty, the sizzle works. If it's just sizzle for sizzle's sake, I don't know. Just remember, somebody made millions of dollars selling the pet rock. <laughs> they did, right? And <laughs> like that happened. That was history. It was guys, real. If you can get if you can get a good deal, if you can get a good deal on a home and create a new asset, create something that no one has ever created, that's value right there. And I, I've done that. I love to buy a wreck. I've been, I always look at wrecks. I love to renovate them. I love to combine things. I enjoy that. So also it, it helps when you have a wreck to tell the seller, I love this. I know how to navigate this. I know right. I'm, I'm in the right waters for you. I, I, you've got the right voice at the helm, the right advocate. Right. Your home. Yeah, I, you got the right captain to lead this ship. I mean, that's that's, that's, that's right. Yeah, I love that's, the sawdust, that's, man. I love yeah. the sawdust. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, listen, we're we're winding down, and I got one final question. Yes, sir. Um, what what do you see as the biggest challenges to getting a deal done right now today? Um, with all the deals that you do, I guess the ones that don't work out. Um, what's going on? I gotta tell you, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it a little bit and say that I've never had to advocate harder for my my clients and my customers it's my pleasure to do it, it it's freaking exhausting but yeah but we do it and i mean every day on point what's going on pushing the narrative the attorneys are slammed the managing agents are slammed and you have to find that delicate balance of being 
pushy and advocating without being a pain in the ass. Yeah. Sending out thank you notes to managing agents. I'm sending out communiques with attorneys. I'm really investing in the relationships, maybe more than ever. And hopefully that's helping to navigate. I'm just major communication has never been more important because when it's busy, when everyone is, has deal fatigue and buyer fatigue and seller fatigue and the attorneys, man, God bless them. They have been yeah. their humps because yeah. all day long, they have people like me calling going, stay on point, stay on point, stay on point. And it's like you, you, you run that little risk of being too much. Yeah. You gotta find that place where you're just attractive and getting it done. And that, that's something we always need to do because we agents are really, we're middle people, middlemen, middle women. We propose yeah. things to get it done. So that's- I'm so glad you said that. I'm so, I'm so glad you said that because radio silence is the worst. Oh my God. Uh, radio silence is the absolute worst. And, and time kills all deals. Time kills all like, I mean, and, and those, so, yeah. so you, that fine balance of keeping everyone on point in a timely manner without crossing it and becoming annoying, to the, it's, and, it's and a it's, delicate. It has to become our pleasure to do. Yeah. I um, love it. My training comes from the four seasons, the Ritz Carlton. You just, if you've ever had the pleasure of experiencing five-star service and you know what that feels like, it will yeah. stay in your DNA forever. And that goes for people when I've got a $25 million buyer it also goes for that walk-up person at three ninety nine yeah. or less. Everyone gets that five star experience, and that also goes for dealing with our colleagues, our attorneys, our managing yep. agents. Yep. As much as we want to roll our eyes, yes, they deserve the five star service too because everybody's mm -hmm. been through a lot, and everybody's got a lot on their backs. Yeah, and you don't know everybody's story. Buy, buy a gift for the uh, for the attorney and for the managing agent and 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 get those relationships trusted. You'll need them in the future. Good I love up, it. Man. This is, this has been great. Um, Brian Lewis, you are absolutely amazing. Brian Lewis of Compass Top Producer, thank you for joining us today. That Guys, is John. Can I Walker. just say? Can I just yes. say? We love you. What, what you give our about. industry is so helpful, and you're doing it. It's real. It's quick, hey, concise. We lean into that, and we really appreciate that. I'm speaking for the industry. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so Brian. much. That was that was unexpected, and that is uh, that that just made my day right there and warms my heart. Thank you, Brian Lewis. That is John Walkup. I am Noah You're Rosenblatt. Welcome. We're both from Urban Digs. This has been Talking Manhattan, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys.